Good evening, everybody. Um, I know you were expecting to see more than just my bright and shining face tonight, but uh, Jolly is taken a little bit ill. I believe he has some strep throat. So uh, Jolly, so sorry you couldn't be here tonight, but um, so this is not Marvel Crisis Protocol like you might be seeing. Uh, instead, we decided to do a little bit of a hobby stream and kind of a premiere uh, what it would be like if it was just me, a camera, and a whole bunch of paints. So in the future, we'll get back, we'll play some Marvel Crisis Protocol. But we thought in the meantime, we'd let you guys get a little bit of an inside on how my noggin works when painting these models. So for the next few hours, we're just going to uh, hang out. I've got the Twitch chat on my monitor right here. I've got looking at myself up there. If you see me looking up, make sure everything's in frame. You guys are right there. Uh, we got several beautiful camera angles tonight, so you guys will be able to see the action. We've got the face cam, we've got this side camera, and then if we switch the views, you'll have the main painting cam right here, so you'll be able to work, see what's going on. Uh, Son of Carnelian, hello. Hi, how you doing? Hi, Mom. I see you're in chat, too. It's very nice to see you guys. Um, so, yeah, for the next few hours, we're just going to be sitting here. We're going to be painting together. Um, if you want to just chat with me, go ahead. I've got it up here. Talk back and forth. If you want some advice, let me know. Um, yeah, so we're going to get going. First things first, uh, tonight we are painting what is called a Yonti Anathema. This is a big snake creature from Dungeons & Dragons made by WizKids Minis. The same people who create Dungeons & Dragons, a different subsidiary. But these are what are called pre-primed miniatures. You can buy them at any of your local hobby stores, including uh, Guard Tower. But uh, they come, as soon as you open them out of the box, they are ready for you to put paint on them. Normally, uh, plastic on the miniatures comes and it's a little hard for the paint to stick and so you need to buy what's called primer. And you cover that with the model so then your acrylics or your oils or whatever type of paint you want will stick to it. But these WizKid miniatures, they come pre-primed so you open the box and you can start slapping paint on right away. Um, if you can look though, uh, because it's all mass produced, there are some flaws with it. Sometimes the primer can be a little bit thick and cover up some of the details. And you get something like, if you see right here, you get seams and you get lines and you get mold lines from the production process. So before we get diving in with the painting here, uh, we're going to get to do some cleanup. Um, hi, Sean. How's Adepticon? I see you're in chat here. Nice to see the producer coming in, checking to make sure that his little peons are doing well. Um, let's see here. All right, uh, doing some cleanup. So I've got my hobby knife, and I'm going to be taking it, and I'm going to be using the edge not to cut, but to scrape to try and get some of these lines off. You know what? Before we get started, I'm going to use my personal phone here to get some background royalty-free music going, because it's just me and the camera here for a few hours. I'd like to have a little bit something to listen to in the background. Just one second. Alrighty. Hi, Deanna. Uh, I'm going to try not to stab myself, but, you know, I have done it before, so. <laughs> uh, I've got some experience with these sorts of things. We'll see how it goes. So, yeah, I'm just going to take the, the edge of the blade here, and I'm going to scrape across the mold lines to get rid of them. Um, generally bad gamers in chat. Hi, Jolly. I know you're sick tonight. Um, Sorry that you are not feeling well, so. But thanks for joining us anyways. So, yeah, I have been accident prone in the past. You can ask my mom in chat. You can ask uh, Dangerous Deanna. You can ask all those sorts of people. But uh, I have hurt myself pretty badly in the past. And when I hurt myself, it's usually not, uh, not a small ordeal. So 
So I'm being gentle as I go. I just want to get the raised area by that mold line. I don't want to scrape off any of the detail that's being shown. There's a small mold line across the body. I'm just trying to get rid of that. Unfortunately, this large one is less of a mold line and more of a joining of two different parts of the figure that has some gaps. I could fill that if I want, but uh, I'm not going to tonight because the filling needs to take some time to dry and seal. So not going to do that. We're just going to move on and we're going to paint over it and hopefully by the end we can disguise it a little bit. Uh, Mr. Jones, 1577, welcome in. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Tony's dad, hi dad. Yes, I'm gonna watch out for dumpsters. He's referring to when I was riding my bike or learning to ride my bike per se, and uh, it took me a long time. And even if I was pointed away from it, I've always somehow managed to turn the bike around and collide headfirst with the dumpsters. Got a bad bit sticking out on the back of the neck, so I'm gonna try and smooth that over here. For being a relatively cheap miniature, these WizKid models are actually pretty good, all things considered. I know that it, when we, in the past, we played uh, Dungeons & Dragons Onslaught, I wasn't, said I wasn't as happy with the miniatures. Well, those are their pre-painted ones, and given the choice between doing that and painting my own, I'd prefer to paint my own. Uh, hello, Mrs. Tony McKenzie, hello, welcome in. Thank you for joining me tonight. I hope your uh, schooling and testing went well. Try not to put my hand too much in the way, but sometimes it can't be helped. Also, uh, Mackenzie, don't pay too close attention as to what I'm painting. You definitely won't be seeing that in an upcoming session of our Dungeons & Dragons game. Alright, so I've gotten rid of, I'd say, the worst of the mold lines, but we're really here to get painted. Um, let's see here. So now i got to think, what do I want the color scheme to be for this? So I want it to pop on the table, but I also don't want it to be kind of loud because sn snakes and the snake sort of people, they've, they've got some natural camouflage to them. So I'm, I'm not thinking going with bright colors, uh, maybe something a little more subtle that might do it. Um, let's see, there were some references I found online. There is one that I liked a lot. Yeah. So. There's this one, if you can see it a little bit. This is just Google pictures. Um, it's got, so it has yellow underbelly, and then it's got a gray back with some darker gray dots and speckles around it. I think I might be going for something a little like that. So, Let's start that out. We'll do uh, the back of it first. So we'll hit all of the scaly bits and we'll do it. We'll start with the base coat, which will be what I'll build up from. Um, we'll ignore the belly scales first. So I need to give myself a nice, let's go a mid gray for the base coat. And then I'll build it up lighter and darker as we see fit. Uh, my preferred paint brand is Pro Acryl. Um, they just, they make really nice paints. It goes on smoothly. Usually only need one or two coats. And the pigment sizes isn't that large. So it's really nice. I think that they're top quality out of all the ones that at least we sell at Guard Tower that I have easy access to. There's a few other brands. Um, if you're looking for something a little bit 
I'd say a little bit more affordable. You can go for Vallejo or Dungeons & Dragons WizKids. They actually started their own line of prismatic paints, they call them. So you could go for that if you want, or you could also go for Games Workshop paints by Citadel. They've got the largest range, and if you're painting Warhammer figures, uh, a lot of their paint schemes use their own paints. In fact, all of theirs do. But it's all up to you. Um, looking at chat here. Jolly, I have not started painting my tiny War Master stuff yet, but I have started to prime them. Uh, he's talking about a tiny, tiny Warhammer game. It's like the figures are that big in comparison to this giant snake monstrosity that I have in front of me. Um, and I'm going to be painting up an Egyptian army for that, skeletons and whatnot. They're primed. I've got a zenithal coat over them, but other than that, haven't touched them. I've been painting everything else for this stream. Um, Deanna, of course you vote pink and sparkly. I'll, I'll paint you something pink and sparkly one of these days. Yep. Mr. Jones, uh, I too, as you can see, I have almost all of the Pro Curl paints. I love them. I'm glad to hear that you're playing with them as well. Uh, listen, Mackenzie, I told you not to worry about what you're seeing on this table. All right, so I'm going to go in and I'm going to start with the base coat. Uh, the rule of thumb is to use two lighter coats. So if this first one looks a little bit splotchy, that's a-okay. Um, I'm using a number two Pro Curl brush. It is my workhorse. It does the majority of it. I could probably go larger. You know, I probably should go larger. There's a lot to cover here. So we'll go with their number four. Larger bristle. Larger bristle. For those of you that aren't in the family, uh, I apologize for the family reunion chat going on in the room. It's, I've got some of my biggest fans here, my wife, my sister, my parents, and they're all complaining about how I still haven't created my uh, sister's wedding present yet. And you know what? Fair. Have not gotten around to doing it, and I apologize. Yep, Mr. Jones, uh, these are indeed snake heads. So if you think a cross between Medusa hair and a Hydra, you get this sort of thing. It is a yon T anathema if you're looking for that sort of thing. Jelly, could you make us a, uh, a hand snake monster? You can just glue a few hand figures instead of heads. It would be pretty simple. Bring that in in one of our D&D Onslaught games as a custom enemy to face. 
Uh, one of the things about this Pro Curl brand is though, it is pretty thin coming straight out of the pot. So if you do thin it down at all, it might do what's happening right here. And it might pull away and start to almost act like a wash and go into the recesses. So I'll definitely have to hit that area that I just put out with a few more coats. Beginning stages always look a little bit jank, in my opinion. In a lot of people's opinion, actually. Make sure you guys say hi to our producer, Clay. He's also going to be alone in a room for the next few hours. Uh, it's just me and him tonight. So, appreciate you saying hi and stopping by to chat to keep us company here. If you like using an airbrush, Pro Krill paints are really great for that. Um, you pretty much don't even need to use paint thinner. You can put it straight into your airbrush pot with a little bit of flow improver, and you're just good to go. Yeah, there seems to be a little bit of an adverse reaction between the WizKids primer that they have on this and the Pro Krill paints. So it's just, if you don't mind putting in some extra work, it's not that bad. Uh, Clay would love to chime in. He is, however, in a completely separate room. He's in a small producer's studio off to the side. So if he did say something, you probably couldn't hear him. I don't know. Clay, say something. Clay. Say something. Yeah, he probably said something and I couldn't hear it. Soundproofing. I'm just going through. And getting down this first base coat. There you go, that's Clay in the chat, that's Guard Tower Games. Mr. Jones, what are you painting currently? What do I find the easiest to do and the hardest? Like with a, with a miniature specifically? There, there's several things that I could consider to be easy and hard. Sorry, I turned off the music because it keeps playing ads. Turn it back up here in a second. The base coat, you're allowed to be pretty messy.
because you can clean things up when you go for some detailing or highlighting. Um, decision I'm going to have to make here, are the arms going to be underbelly covered, colored I should say, or are the, or are the arms going to be scale colors? I think I'm going to go scale colors. I think that'll read a lot better and more natural. I can be whatever I want. Snakes don't have arms. At least not any snake that I've met. So yeah, even if I'm getting it on where the yellow underbelly scales are, I don't care that much. I'm gonna, I can just go back and fix it. I'd say one of the easier things that you do would be to just kind of sit down and start slapping on like base coats like I'm doing here. Even though it's easy, it's not my favorite part because it's kind of boring and it generally looks pretty bad to just be base coated. I'm going to get some more paint on my palette here. See if I can get that a little bit in the camera. I know some people like seeing palette. Yeah, we'll see how that goes. Get some more paint going. So what do you find easiest or hardest to do, painting minis? I choose specifically or generally painting. All right, so for miniature painting, like I said, the easiest part is base coating or priming, but I don't tend to go for that as my favorite part because it's boring. Uh, hardest part is, I'd say, highlighting, building up those areas that are pointing towards the sun or a light source in a smooth manner to make it to make your different layers of paint not stick out so you can see that it's clearly like a an orange and then a yellow i the hard part is making it transition smoothly but things like that are actually my favorite because i get to sit down take some time and use some techniques uh, there's a lot of different techniques on highlighting. I'm not going to go too much into them right now, but as I do different things, I'll point them out. How do I get it to stick to the handle? I'm actually using a special handle. Uh, this is by Citadel. Um, it has a locking mechanism, so I can pull this apart and it comes off. So it's a clamp in my hand. I'm about done with the first base coat. Still some splotchiness, still some areas that haven't gotten covered because it's a scaly texture, so the paint doesn't quite get into all the nooks and crannies. So we're going to go back over and get another coat on. All in all, we're probably not going to finish this tonight. Um, if we do do more live streams of me painting, uh, we'll probably continue to work on this together if I don't need it for my own table by that time. But I think it'd be nice if we all sat and completed a model together. You can see the whole process. And we'll see how that goes. I do also use putty uh, sometimes when I'm sticking models on if they don't fit nicely onto the handle. I do have just, I trim a couple inches of dowel rod. And so I have a small cylinder and then I put some putty on top and then I can just stick the model right on there and the adhesion will keep it. 
Painting handles are really nice because this way I don't have to touch the miniature at all. So eliminates that portion of mess. And so I can take, I can hold it at pretty much any angle so I can get to it as I need. I see you have a green screen. Does it mean I could be painting in space or under the ocean? Uh, that is a question for Clay. So uh, we'll see. We don't know. We don't know where I might be painting. We don't know if that can change or not. Wink, wink. He's probably groaning. You mean like, no, don't make me do this. Yeah. So for the areas that the paint has stuck, it's actually gotten really good coverage. So I don't need to do a full second coat. I just need to do a touch up job. So if you can see like along this area here, you got only some specks where it didn't stick in like the little nooks and crannies, but where it has stuck, it's actually pretty smooth. Might switch to a smaller brush here soon because this one's actually fraying a little bit and I can't get it to stick and that's annoying me. The big bet test of tonight will be can Tony talk for three hours straight to himself? Answer is probably. <laughs> yeah, I need to find a different. There we go. That one might be better. Uh, the answer is yes. Yes, it is. Let's be honest with ourselves. I can talk for three hours to myself. Yep, I'm thoroughly annoyed by this size brush. I'm putting it away. I'll have to go and condition it sometime to try and keep that point and not split, but for now, I will be sad and I will move on. We'll go to the number two. Some more paint on the palette. Base coats take up the most paint especially for large figures. I mentioned uh, airbrushing before. That is one of the ways that people get a nice base coat over large figures, but you'll also have to do a lot more cleanup because it'll spray everything, not just where you want. Yeah, this is, this is what I like. I like this control. How will I paint the scales? So I'm gonna use a combination of several techniques. One of those techniques is called dry brushing. And I will explain more how that happens when I do it. But the long and short of it is I will take a large bristled brush, I will put some paint on it, and then I will wipe most of the paint away. So there's just a little bit residue left. And then I'll take it and I will go very quickly over the whole model and it will just leave paint on the raised scales. And so it'll be a nice picking out of those details. And the bits that are a little bit in there. Heads all tangled together. Oh. 
I'm going to do the whole snake head too. If I need to change that, I will, but better be safe than sorry when it comes to these base coats. Because if I move on to highlighting and I realize that something isn't base coated, then that's just going to make me flustered. This is also my first time painting on camera, so uh, if you have any suggestions or you can't see, please let us know and we'll try to fix it for you. Yep, I, I am a little introverted, so talking three hours to other people face to face might be a bit much for me. But now, tell me to use a silly voice and pretend that I'm some mythical creature, I could do that for a long time. Dungeons and Dragons is fun. How many times have I been flustered? You mean tonight? Or in general, because in general, that's a lot of times. Just going through and picking out white parts on all the back scales. I think people would be put off if I always used a silly voice and pretended I was someone else. Some people might think that I need to be uh, evaluated for further issues. But you would know about that, wouldn't you, Deanna? Just kidding. I'm kidding. For those of you that don't know, Deanna is my sister, so I'm allowed to pick on her. Older spe sister to be specific. Well, I thought it wouldn't play any ads on this channel, but it did. So I'm sorry, there are random people talking in the background. talk like William Shatner Day, I don't have that good of a Shatner impression. So I'm not going to try it. I'm not going to try it. I do appreciate some uh, spoken word poetry sometimes though. Base coating is taking a while, but that's just because this is such a textured model. I have painted some snakes before, and 
they've all gone like this. I painted the giant boa constrictor from WizKids a while ago and ran into a lot of the problems I'm running into here, but we'll get through it. I've got you guys to keep me company. And the paint. Generally bad gamers, aka Jolly asks, do I always base coat or do I sometimes just prime and then go color by color without an overall base coat? Um, so when I say I base coat, um, I do it section by section. I, I will almost never give the entire model its base coats and colors. Um, so I won't, you won't be seeing me right now go in and doing the yellow underbelly. I will get to that later. So I'm going to work on the gray for a long while until I feel like I'm at a good stopping point for that. Um, and then I will go into the yellow. And then once I have both of those to a point where I'm enjoying them, I will start to work on the model as a whole and do the details. But I usually like to take it one section at a time because that's where my brain is focusing at the moment. Plus it helps me get out of the uh, ugly zone of miniature painting faster when I can see at least there's one part that's pretty. There's some paint goop stuck in the cap of this bottle, got it. So the base coat that I've chosen is actually going to be closer to the shadow colors for this entire thing. I did that because I tend to not do what's called the wash step. Um, it's a, it is a fast and effective way, but I actually prefer to have more control over where I put the shadows. And that's what the shade is tend to be used for. You will see me using it a little bit here because it helps with highly textured areas that are more difficult to manually shadow. Um, honestly, I could do both and it would look the same, but I will have taken more time to have manually done it. So I'm doing a overall shadow base coat and then I'm going to apply a little bit of a wash, which will also help get rid of some of these white specks over the whole thing. So I'm just gonna get some more on the heads here, let it dry. I might have to change up my whole process here because live streaming, it's not good for me to just set it down and walk away. Normally I would wait for like everything to dry and then continue. So I might have to try that whole jumping between different parts deal. So you'll, you'll be trying out new techniques with me, seeing what works here. So your base coat changes with each mini. Um, the base coat is just what color each section is generally. So yeah, with each mini, the base coat will change. Uh, I think you might be thinking of what's called the prime coat, which I was able to skip here. It's what I spray over the plastic to make all the paint stick. Um, the prime coat is usually the same from model to model. Uh, I do mine in black. And so I'll spray the whole thing black and then I'll build up colors with base coats and highlights from that. Um, I think that might be what you're thinking of. Uh, B34 Mish, B Mish maybe? Hello, welcome to chat. Glad you could join us. All right, let's see here. Um, looking at the model. I think I'm gonna have to be happy with that as a base coat. It's a little section here, but 
in order to keep things moving along. And ultimately, the final product will not care how long I take on this step. So it might just be prudent if I move along. Make sure I get all of the snake heads. There's a bunch of them. How many have we got? We got one, two, three, four, five, six different heads that I'm going to have to account for here. That'll be fun. A few months ago, we were actually going to try doing this on a stream here, but um, we ended up not having password permissions. Uh, our lovely producer, Sean, uh, he was out of town, and we just we couldn't get the communication going as well. And so we ended up having to forego stream that week if you were around back then. So this is take number two, and I'd say we're doing a lot better than we were. Just picking out the areas that I... I'm seeing that I missed now that I'm looking at the miniature at a whole underside of the arms, inside of the hands. And this is where the big paint handle is coming in nicely. Because if I was just holding the miniature by itself, it would be a little bit of a finger Olympics to get it to the right spot where I could paint it. But I'm also not like messing up the model as I do it. If you see me looking up at the monitor, it's just me making sure that the model is in shot. I apologize if I move it out of the shot. Okay, faces, faces. Eh, that's pretty good. Not perfect, but Different areas will get handled as this goes on. Give that a second. Make sure the base coat dries by itself. The acrylics, those actually dry pretty fast, especially if you're using thin coats. Um, what I was referring to not drying fast, those would be um, the washes, which I will break one out right now. Since this is a gray snake, I'm going to be using Citadel's Nuln Oil Shade. Uh, this is a special type of paint that is designed to collect in the recesses of the model, all the little nooks and crannies like between the scales and pull away from the raised areas to give the effect of shading and shadow. And so a lot of people will use this on regular miniatures overall to kind of give it those shadows. Um, I only like to use it on texture because of reasons that I've said before. It makes it a lot simpler and sometimes a little bit cleaner for it to do its job than for me to go in and manually shade in between all the scales. That would take forever. I don't have forever. Uh, that's their cure-all too clean. Non oil. Too ugly. Non oil, says Jolly. I mean, yeah, a lot of people do subscribe by the whole Nuln Oil uh, process. Unfortunately, I am not one of those. Can we see a super close-up? Yeah, we'll see how close I can get here with the whole autofocus. So this is about as close as I think I can get without it going too blurry. So as you can see, all that I've done is I've applied a single gray color to all the areas that I want to be gray. Let's see if I can, if it'll be a little bit closer. Will it autofocus over here? Yeah, it'll autofocus over here. We'll get close. We'll get closer. Hello. Glam cam. So we've gotten Pretty gray all over. There's a few specks of white here and there. Of course, the whole underbelly is still white. But we'll take care of that. 
especially with this step. So, like I was saying, null oil itself, it goes on. I'm going to slop it everywhere. I'm going to control it a little bit as we go on, and it'll sink into those recesses. Do I have a single color backdrop so we can easily see the changes? No, unfortunately I do not have a single color backdrop. I mean, if you would take this tabletop-ish, I can clear away a little bit so you can see, but it's a little samey right now. There's not too much to see. All I've done is apply one color. All right, I'm going to break out a number three brush for this one. A little bit larger than my number two, but I'm going to be a little less careful. So with these pots, they don't drop. They actually, I dip into them. Get enough on here and then so I'll just start applying it. As you can see, it's taking the scales and it's almost picking them out by making the area around them a little darker. If you can see that. So I'm only going to use this on the scaled areas. I'm going to be ignoring the arms because the arms are nice and smooth. This won't have many resources to collect in and so it'll just kind of pool where it wants. And where it wants is typically not where I want it. But with places like this textured scale, where it wants is where I want it. So chat or comments or whoever is reading this, let us know if you want to see more of this in the future. This is definitely something that we might be able to make a semi-regular occurrence. And I know I'd be interested in doing it. So all we need to know is, would you like to see this? Beamish, how many unpainted figures do you have? I'm curious as to what your uh, pile of shame looks like in comparison to my own. Got to be careful when dipping my brush here. There are many horror stories of people who've knocked over their null oil. I'm not too sure the people who also use a studio would be very happy if I got black paint spilled everywhere. Um, you might also see, if you don't, I'll point it out, this has the consistency of almost a water, so it is more apt to run all over the place. Sorry, I'll move my hand. If you wanted, you could take this whole process a lot faster than I am because um, Nuln Oil is Nuln Oil and it's going to do its thing. But I like to make sure that I apply it in a little bit of a methodical way to make sure it doesn't go everywhere that I may not want it. So I'm really taking control 
and precision with it and using it exactly how I want. Yep, and just like I predicted, it is filling in all the little tiny white specks here and there. Do I have any tips for working with the oil? So it depends on what you want it to do for you. Uh, for the most part, if you've just been starting out with miniature painting or you don't care to do manual uh, shadows and you want to just go through, get something painted and just applying it all over, that is legitimately a thing people do and I have done it before. Not so much nowadays, but I used to. Um, if you get Nuln Oil where you don't want it, you can take your brush, you can clean it off, and you can actually use it to soak up, like you have a dry brush in your hands, and you can soak up the watery Nuln Oil from where you don't want it. So I'm, you can kind of see, it's a little shiny because it's wet, but I'm pulling back the Nuln Oil here. And so I can use a dry brush to do that if you don't get it where you want. If you don't want your Nuln Oil to be as dark, and this goes for all washes, especially by Citadel and Games Workshop, you can put it in a little, little paint pocket tray, whatever you call those things, and then add a few drops of water. You're thinning it out, and so it'll be a little bit less intense if you don't want the stark blackness to it. But Nuln Oil itself is pretty magical. It, it will elevate a paint job to the next level if you just use it by itself. Because already, let's see, we'll use the glam shot here. Already you can see more definition in all of the scales. The whole model has gotten a little bit darker. That's another one of the effect of applying Nuln Oil everywhere, is you will give everything a shade of black on top of the base coat already there. That's another reason why I don't particularly use it that much, is because it tints the whole model, a color that I didn't necessarily want it to be. Um, I'm going to go over the faces because there's a lot of detail on the faces and then it'll help me in the future to see where the detail is. And so in this instance I'm going to use it but I will cover it up later. Thank you for stopping by Deanna. I really appreciate you coming to hang out with me, to chat, keep us all company. Hope that work goes well for your husband. I'm just going through making sure I don't miss any areas. Sometimes I might go back and put a second coat where it didn't pick out things the way I wanted it to. This is all part of making sure you control it so it doesn't go everywhere that you don't want it to go.
underside of that tail down there. And I will put it on the hands a little bit. There's a lot of small nooks that I seem to have not been able to get with the base coat. I'd say that's pretty good. Give that a second. We're not going to wait for it to fully dry. We might move on to some other base coats. I know that's not what I said I do normally, but in light of keeping things moving along here, I'm not going to wait fully for this Nuln oil to dry. Um, so, chat, how many of you guys do miniature painting here? And like, how much miniature painting do you do? I'm interested to find out. A little bit of touch up on some of the arms here with the original gray. Even now, I'm finding bits that I missed before. I want to get those taken care of as soon as possible. Six heads is a lot of heads to keep track of. A lot of heads. All right, let's see. We'll hold you. Hello, focus. So it's a little bit shiny in some areas because the Nuln oil is still drying, but as you can kind of see here, we've got a lot more definition in those scales, especially along the back here. A lot more definition. And that's exactly what I was going for. Do I have a favorite style mounting block to hold the mini? Uh, this is actually my favorite style. The, it doesn't have any sticky bits that, I don't know, it, if it's a small mini, it's fine, but larger ones tend to peel off of it. The clamping mechanism is really nice. I have two of these. I've got the, the Chungus XL here, which holds large minis, like the Anathema we're working on. And then I also have a smaller one, which will hold regular size minis, uh, heroic scale, if you will. They didn't want to make it a Hydra. A Hydra is actually a completely different creature. Um, I specifically picked up the uh, Yuan T Anathema here because it's relevant for my personal Dungeons and Dragons campaign that I am a DM for. So this creature belongs to a Serpent Society. This is general lore. I'm not giving away spoilers to anyone who's in my campaign. Uh, they're all part of the same society, and so I want to make sure I picked up one of these. Nine heads? I mean, we've got... I don't know if you're talking about this specifically, but we've got one, two, three four, five, six heads, and two arms. That's what we got going on this baby. Yeah, um, I'm not going to be painting any of this base because I actually do my own basings I could if I wanted paint this up a little bit, but all in all, I'm gonna actually put on some dirt texture and some own plants and make it look like it's actually in a jungle here. I might do something different. We've got a lot of open space in the center. 
I might put some big rocks. I might, I don't know, find some temple ruins maybe. See if I can put it going up and around that. So I'm gonna leave this at the very least. I'm gonna leave this gray. All right, well the Nuln oil dries, let's find a nice base coat for the scales. So these are going to be a yellow. Uh, I don't know how many heads hydras typically have. In Greek mythology, it was never specifically stated how many it had, I don't think. Um, the whole point is that it could always get larger. Hydra heads are when you cut off one, two more grow in its place. So at one instance, it might have five, but in the next instance, it might have seven, eight, nine more. So the number of heads in a hydra isn't consistent from animal to animal, uh, and even from story to story, because it's not supposed to be. Hydra heads are supposed to just be numerous. All right, I'm gonna go for a deeper yellow for the underbelly, so I'm not gonna go for an orange, although that could be nice. This is a pretty bright orange, though. I've got orange and yellow for the belly. I don't think I want to take it too much into the fiery uh, hues that an orange will bring it towards. Definitely don't want to use a red. So I might change this later, but I'm going to go with this yellow ochre and start using that to base coat the belly scales. A nest might be interesting. I haven't thought of that. Um, hmm. That would definitely be something to construct, which I'm not above doing. Picture book idea. The loneliest hydra, a one-headed hydra. <laughs> That's a pretty good idea, Jolly. You should, uh, you should see about getting that made up here. Maybe that'll be a, a table-ready original publication. Greens? Um, I'm actually trying to stay away from green on this guy. So I know snakes can be green and that, that has been a good look for my reptiles that I've painted in the past. But for this one, I want him to stand out from what will be his environment that he'll be in and it'll be jungle. So there'll be plenty of greens on the grass and I'm not going for a uh, camouflage into his surroundings not necessarily in the jungle, because I want it to have good readability on the table. So I'm gonna go for a different type of camouflage and go for a darker gray that some snakes have. So in that terms, I'm doing the camouflage, but I don't wanna do green because I want it to be different than what the base surrounding area will be, if that makes sense. Isn't a one-headed hydra a snake? Yeah. It's a snake with potential to be a hydra, I guess. Let's see here, get a good shot lined up. All right, so for this base coat, I'm going to be more careful because if I overshoot the boundaries, it'll go into the gray that I've already done and I'll have to reapply gray and I just don't want to do that. Inevitably, I'll do it here or there. It's a lot of concentration that I probably will break. But I'm going to try my hardest to be neat with this base coat. Strictly because it's around an area that I've already touched. One of the challenges with this model of putting a yellow next to a gray a saturated color next to a desaturated color will be to make it look natural, which I'm going to endeavor to do. But we'll see that as it comes up. For now, we're just putting on base coats together, hanging out.
might take a little bit before the mini starts to come together and look to what you're used to seeing me painting. That's just because it takes it takes a lot of steps. It wouldn't be it wouldn't be uncommon for me to take over five, six hours on a single miniature, which I'm thinking this one might take at least more than three hours. So we'll probably have to come back to this on another stream if I'm able to. I'm right there. Just messed it up a little bit. I got some yellow where I didn't want to. I'll see if I can get a better shot. So I spilled out a little bit over the edge too far there. It's not terrible, but I'll definitely have to go back and fix that. It does look a little bit like a black rat snake so far. I think that's where I'm drawing some of my inspiration from at least the real world. Because uh, snakes typically have a lighter underbelly than they do over top. It's because their bellies ain't touching the sky really. And it's something that they can use to be like, oh hey, don't mess with me. So I'm gonna turn my belly up at you and you can see, oh look, bright colors. Bright colors means bad. You should go away now. So at least when I'm painting monsters like this, sometimes I like to delve more into the realistic so we get the blending of fantasy and realism. If you're talking about something like my Rainbow Skinks, I throw realism out the window. <laughs> and I'm just going for pretty colors. It all depends on what mood I'm in and what the purpose is for the miniatures that I'm using. Are people hearing me okay? Is my mumbling a little bit too mumbly? All right, now I'm starting to work on the under neck, I guess you'll call it. It's the belly scales that go up each neck. So here is where I'm gonna need some real precision. So I apologize if I don't talk because I'm concentrating a little bit.
A belly, a, a belly up snake is dead. Yeah, that's also true. Or at least faking it. Like when a, when a cobra raises up and then it spreads out those ear fans. That's another one of those warnings of, hey, I'm showing you something you don't typically see. You should probably run away now. In a way, we're all scared of some change. Relate that back to life, I guess. Yep, I'm getting some yellow on the faces here, but it really can't be avoided. Ah! My bad. I pushed it out of the clamp. I was holding it a little too awkwardly with my hand there. My hand raised up a bit. It can be a downside if you don't get a good grip on it. It might jump out, but it wasn't too terrible. I wasn't at a point where it much mattered. If you're interested to just jump ahead and see what some of my finished works are, that's actually my Instagram handle that's printed up on the screen, at Maggio Minis. If you go onto Instagram and you type that in, you'll be able to find a lot of my finished works there. That's where I tend to have my portfolio going. Check it out, see what you think. Leave your Instagram handle so I can look at your stuff too. Yep, definitely we'll have to go back and clean up. That's another one of the issues that you might find with these WizKid mass-produced miniatures is some of the detail is just a little bit wonky. It's not as clearly defined as I might like. And so I have to take some artistic liberties in determining where the seam is between scale and underbelly. And there's an area that I just can't help it. Um, you can kind of see it. Right in there, there is a neck to a head that I have no good angle at getting at because I'd have to turn my brush and get it in from this side or I'd have to go in here. So I'm gonna have to just eat my pride and send in the yellow paint this way, go up at it and it's gonna get on the gray. It's going to get on the gray, but it's better to get that base coat on the yellow there now before I work on it. So for this model, it's actually worked out that I didn't finish the gray. And that's something you want to use to judge the difficulty of your own minis is give it a once over with your eyes before you start painting. Pick out some of those future problem areas and make a plan on how to attack them. That'll be pretty nice for yourself and it'll help you get things figured out for when it does get dicey.
I think I'm really digging these rat snake colorations. The yellow with the black looks pretty good and striking. I'm just going to need to desaturate that yellow a little, get a little bit to make it a little less contrasting with the rest of the body because that's not necessarily what I want the focal point to be for this piece. It'll be nice, but I don't want people to immediately just be like, ooh, yellow belly. So we've been working on this for a little over an hour now. Um, and as you can see, I'm still on the base coats. That's a okay. I'm a slow painter. And I got another awkward angle here I'm going to try and get at. Penny miniatures, you got to do what you got to do, man. Sometimes you just got to turn it at a weird, weird angle. There's a little section that has a bunch of Nuln oil still pulled up that I want to paint over. But because it was such a deep recess that it's still pulled up there, there was so much of it and it's not dry. So I'm going to have to wait for that. Um, but yeah, uh, as far as base coats go, I'd say that's pretty good. I'll go over here to you guys. Uh -huh, hello, focusing. Camera or the ring light isn't on this one, so we're gonna have to deal with a little bit of shadows, but that's okay. Uh, yeah, so bellies have all been pretty neatly picked out. There's a little bit of mess that I can go back and fix, but this is the basic color scheme we're working for here. So it'll be up to me to make this look more natural, to kind of blend in that contrasting between the stark yellow and the more natural gray. Uh, what I am going to start with, I think, is the gray. I'm going to go through and I'm going to start making that a little bit more highlighted. Get it a little bit lighter. So the idea is that the body itself is going to be a light gray-ish. And then it's going to have darker gray spots and little colorations. All right, so for this technique, I'm going to start with a dry brushing technique that I mentioned earlier. So I'm going to get a side paper towel. I'm going to take, let's see, should I start with my original gray? I think I'm going to start with my original gray. So I'm going to take the original gray because the Nolan oil has tinted this darker. I want to bring back what it was. So, um, I'm actually going to be right back. I don't have my dry brush with me. It's over in the case, so I'll give you just one second. I'm going to try not to move my chair because it's going to mess up all of the fancy cameras. <laughs> Success. Yeah, I know you're cringing back there, Clay. I did it. I did it. Scooching in. Oof. Cords everywhere. Yeah. <clears throat> Success. I've gotten the dry brushes. So you can really use any type of brush that you want. Some people even use makeup brushes. 
Um, but I have bought specific dry brushes. So this is what it looks like. It's got soft bristles. These are even softer than something you might find on a normal paintbrush. And it's got a large circular type deal. It's going to give me a lot of surface area. So like I said, to do dry brushing, you take your paint and I'm going to put it on a dry surface. This is a wet palette. It's basically a sponge with a little bit of wax paper on top. It helps keep my paints wet longer. That won't work for a dry brushing because I don't want the paint to stay on my brush for very long. So I'm going to use this. I'm going to put a little bit on my paper towel. And the paper towel itself is going to soak up some of that moisture, which is going to help me in my endeavor here. Then I'm going to take the dry brush, I'm going to dab it onto that glob of paint, and then I'm going to take it and I'm going to rub off the majority. So even now, when I take, there's only a little bit on there. That's what I'm looking for. So now I take the model, all of the areas that I want, and I'm going to very lightly just dust over them. And it's going to hit the raised areas, and it's going to pick them out. Might be hard for you to see, but I'm getting some immediate results. If there's too much on it, it's going to penetrate deeper because there's a lot of goop. And I don't want that, so I wanted to make sure I got a lot of it off, get most of the paint off. And very lightly, brush over all of the area that I want, and it's going to pick out all of those raised edges. You can see it right there. There's now some highlights going on. Ta-da! It's very simple. One of the simplest things you can ever do to the greatest effects is learning how to dry brush. So we'll go on the back here. You can see it's a little bit dark. After just a few quick strokes, it's lightened up. I might avoid the areas like under here because that's going to be naturally in the shadow, and so I'm going to leave it in some shadow. It's a little bit like stenciling, but I'm not, I'm not limiting where it's going like you would with a stencil. So I don't have a pattern that it's perhaps following. Okay, I'm going to go and pick out some of the tops of the heads because that's where the most light is going to be shining. The focal point will be the grouping of heads here. So that is where I'm going to be concentrating a lot of my effort going on later is making sure that the detail on those faces and that head cluster is really good because that's what I want people to look at. And so if I want people to look at it, I want to make sure I put in a lot of effort. If I do a lot of effort down here towards the end of the tail, that'll look nice, but that's going to be kind of contrary to what you're looking for uh, when you're at the, on the table. Don't want to look at the, ta at the tail. I want to look at the faces. So that's, a, that's a, actually a pro tip if you're looking to up your game, if you're a miniature painter, is figure out where the focus is on your model and put the most of your effort on that. Doesn't have to be a lot more, but if I put even like 10 more minutes into the face of my miniature than I do on anything else, then the face is going to look that much better. Now, speaking of better, that is, that is pretty good. Um, it's brought back that base coat mid-tone that I wanted. Might be a little, couple extra spots. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to rinse this off. And after I rinse this off in my cup, it's going to be soaking. I can't use this one to dry brush again until it's dry itself. So that's why I have multiple dry brushes. But I want to make sure I get this clean for the future. Mm. 
Might have to go through with some paint cleaner later, but that's good enough. Take, I'm gonna fold this over because I'm gonna use another dry brushing. So, last time I used this one, the neutral gray. So I'm now going to step up one lighter into bright neutral gray, and I'm going to do an even lighter dry brushing. So I'll make sure that there's even less paint on the new brush than there was on the old. And I'll make sure that I get even more of it off on the paper towel and I'll be lighter. So that the blending from dark to light will be more subtle instead of stark, which is what I'm going for, a subtlety between the darks and the lights. Just dabbing a little bit. Let's see if I can get that in shot here. Just gonna dab a little bit onto the end. Doesn't need to be a lot, because now I'm gonna spread this around and get most of it off. It's just a dusting of it on here, which is what I want. And so now I'm not gonna give it an all over dry brushing. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take and I'm going to only apply it to the majority of the area that's facing up. That's facing towards that sun, which is going to be reflecting down upon the model. This one is going to be a little bit harder to see. But that's because I want it to be, like I said, subtle. So if you're working with a big textured model like I am, doing these steps that I've demonstrated using the known oil wash over a base coat and then going back in and using a dry brush over that texture, that is a really fantastic and easy way to make your model look really nice. Now this isn't the last of what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to be going through even still and adding some specular skin blotches and I'm also going to be doing some more highlighting and blending out so it looks kind of my own standards but you'll see that as it happens. All right, I think there's a little bit not enough on this anymore so I'm going to go back in. I'm just going to dip it a little bit and then rub a lot of that out. Get it all off on the paper towel. Just a little bit left on the end of the brush. Just like before. I'm going to go through only on the areas that the sun is shining down. Because those are what are going to be taking the highlights. Yeah, you can see that on the camera there. Starting to have a nice light gray that I was going for. If you are going to be working with dry brushing, that would be an instance where you want to do that area first on your model. If I had done the yellow part to completion and then gone through and done the gray and I'm doing my dry brushing here, it is extremely difficult to make sure that I only hit the gray with the dry brush. I am 100% spilling over and going over parts of this yellow. And if that were done, that would ruin my day. I would be put myself so far back. So if you're doing dry brushing on sections, make sure you do the dry brushing first.
think I might do it just a little bit more and then we'll do one final dry brushing and make it go even lighter. So I'm taking time to focus on the heads because like I said, put the most work in where you want people to look. So already this dry brushing has picked out a lot of details on these faces and it's a lot more readable on the tabletop from like a foot away from your face to even more. And that's what's going to be the ideal viewing distance because that's how far it's going to be. You're going to be sitting at the table and it's going to be out in the middle of the table where your models are fighting it. So. I think that's pretty good. I'm going to give my brush a quick rinse out. We'll show it off on the glam cam and then we'll move on for the, the final dry brushing. All right, so <laughs> Let's see if I can figure this out. Uh, you can see the faces here. You can see the faces pretty well. Um, you can actually start to pick out some deep. There they go. You can pick out some of those details on the faces, like the eye ridges, the frills. Etc. And then if I turn this around, um, you can actually see pretty well where that dry brushing is gone. It's helped to pick out the definition even more. That's what I'm looking for. I want the definition between the brights and the darks. All right, final dry brush. It's a tiny boy because I'm going to be using, let's see here. I think I might as well hit it with just a little bit of white. So this will be the lightest dry brushing yet because white is going to be taking over a lot. So I don't want it to be too much of a takeover on this model. I just want it to be a little bit so I can pick out the areas that are really high and bright. Okay, we'll see how that is. I'll do a couple test swipes here. Yep, that's good. And this one's going to be very sparing. I only want it on the brightest and most focal of points. go back and reload my brush because there's so little on it I need to go back more often I think the top of all of their little noggins here at the physically highest point of the model and then I'm going to go right a little bit along the shoulder ridge. That's also a pretty high point. Just a little bit, just being pretty sparing with it. And I'm not going to touch the rest of the body except maybe the tip of the tail here. That's pretty focal. Dip that a little bit. But I'm not touching the rest of the body with the white because I'm only wanting this area to be the brightest and I want this area to be looked at the most. That's where I put in the most and the brightest highlights. Now there's a happy little yawn tea. <laughs> 
There you go. You're welcome, Jolly. Okay, so let's take a second and look at what we have here. We've got eh, focusing. We got faces. We can actually kind of see those faces now. I'm going to be going back and I'm going to be picking out the details later. But if you're looking for a quick and rough job that has pretty good results, this is kind of what you might want to go for. Let's see, I kept things dark under the curve because this area is going to be naturally in the dark, so I, I'm not taking effort there. It's in the shade, so I'm going to keep it shaded. And the same thing all along the bottom in there. I didn't touch that a lot with the dry brushes. Now, for the underbelly, this is a pretty much a not dry brush area for me. There's larger, and I've already dry brushed around it, so it's going to be harder to control. So I'm done with dry brushing. For the rest of this model, I'm not going to be using that technique. Um, I will, however, go through and I'm going to start doing some manual highlighting on the arms because there's good, there's good uh, highlighting on the body and the heads because of that dry brushing. But now i got to make sure the arms are up to spec as well. So I think I'm actually going to start with some shadows because this is all that base coat color I need to put in the armpits and underneath each of those I need to have some definition to those muscles. You can't have the brights without the darks. So I'm going to go, let's see here, I'm going to go one shade darker on the grays with this dark warm gray. I'm going to put that on my palette and I'm going to start adding some little shadows there. I might take it darker, we'll see how it goes. And this is now where I start to really use some of that precision. I don't want this to go just anywhere. This is where I really want to take my effort and I choose where it goes. And this is really going to help get those definition. Let's see if I can get a good angle here. I'm also going to be using this darker to go and clean up the underside of the faces where the mixture between the gray and the yellow has gotten a little bit questionable. Now, this is going to not be the highest quality paint job that I'll have done. This is what I'll call is a tabletop plus. Uh, so it's just going to be sitting on the tabletop and played in games. Not really going to be display that much, so I'm not going to put in the hours and hours that I might if I wanted to make it. So this will be tabletop plus a little bit elevated passive gameplay, but that's just because I like to make them that way. So if I wanted to, I could spend even more time being particular with the highlights after the dry brush. But for our purposes here, for this, the kind of gameplay it's going to see, we're going to keep it with that. All right, I'm going to also go back and pick out some of those spots where the yellow went over.
probably going to bring in back some of that neutral gray instead of this darker shade and make sure I don't make it too dark. And this spot's in a pretty shaded spot, so I'll happily use this darker shade here. Clean that up. Might need to go back with a little bit of Nuln Oil to pick that, pick those scales back into place. Uh, Tony's mom says, that was a deep life lesson. <laughs> you can't have light without the dark. I mean, it's true though. Uh, you don't really experience the highs of life unless you also kind of know what it's like to be in those lows. Each of them brings balance to the other. If you're constantly riding on highs, then they don't feel the same. You need the difference to see one versus the other, to really get some perspective. And so you can apply that in multiple things, like you can apply it to life, I'm applying it to miniature painting, all sorts of places. Hmm. Just looking over where else I might touch up with this darker. There's a little section in here. Being careful to avoid the finished dry brushed areas as much as possible. side of this guy's chin. Still splotches of those uh, primer coats that were already there showing through. So I'll clean those up. Now, I think that's pretty good in terms of how the gray is looking. So, yeah. Just one more section. I forgot to do the other armpit. And it's kind of showing through. I think I'm going to go to the black and I'm going to really pick out the darkest parts of the shadows. So, the armpits, some of the under crests of the neck where it's really gotten in a um, little bit of under the head. I'm really going to make sure that it's known that those are shadows and they should be treated as such. Don't need a lot. Black can be overpowering. And we want this to read gray, not black. So I want to make sure the majority of this is gray. So I really just am using this where this model is absolutely no light.
putting some under the frills that are not showing straight up or to the side. Make those dark. So not every not every uh, cobra head here has its hood open. So I, I want it to be a little bit clearer which ones have their hoods open from a distance. And that'll help with the readability and the story of what's going on here. What moment in time has been captured? When I look at this, I got to think that to myself. What moment in time is this mini reflecting? And it looks like it's threatening right now. It's looking down at some prey or at some adventurers who have come to it, and it's really trying to loom over them and threaten them. So most of the hoods of their frills are open and doing that danger warning, and their its mouth is hissing at them. So that's helping me determine where I should be putting my paints, is to help reflect that point of the story that's happening. Maybe a little bit of black down in the deepest section up here to help sell that he's coiling around and forward. Yeah, that helps a little bit. Also do that right underneath the tip of the tail here. Right underneath that. There's still some primer down here. And I'll just take care of that with some straight black as well, since that's so far underneath. Just take care of that problem before it becomes a bigger problem. Okay, so, taking care of the manual shadows, made all the dark points dark. Now let's focus on some highlights. So, this is being thrown all over the floor. I know I've sung the praises of this clamp thing, but usually it's clamping around a base of a model, which is a strict circular pattern. And this is a little bit oblong, so it's having a harder time clamping on it. All right. So the main color of this body has been the neutral gray by Procryl. For the first round of highlights on the arms, I'm going to just simply, once again, step it up one point. Go for this bright neutral gray. Go for the arms here with that. I'm going to thin down this paint a little bit with some water. And I like to use the back of my thumb to test the consistency of the paint. That's just about right. Alrighty. So I will be touching the model here to kind of rest my hand because my hands shake a little bit and when I need precision, I need to make sure they're nice and not shaky. See, that's, that's a bit too much of a highlight there. That's about too much. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mix a little bit of that neutral gray into the bright neutral. Going to get a combination of those two. So I'll take this even more incrementally. Because I want that blend to be nice and light. And I'm going to start to define the muscles of the arm. Going over a lot of it, and then with each successive highlight, I'm going to go over less and less. Let's see if I can arrange myself here.
as I use the brighter and brighter highlights on the arms, I'll be even more choosy as to even which sections of the arms get highlights. See, you can compare how this arm looks to this arm. This one is starting to be more cohesive with the rest of the body and where the highlights are at this level of the model compared to even down a little bit lower. Highlights are trickier, yes. In my opinion, they are, but only if you want the highlight blends to be smooth. If you want it to look seamless going from dark to light, it takes a lot more effort. There are several techniques I use for a majority of the time. I use what's called layering. So I'll take and I'll do my mid-tone in, say, one big circle. And then I'll add a little bit of a brighter color to the mid-tone. And I'll get a mix of the two. And I'll do that in just a little bit smaller of a circle. And then I'll keep on repeating that process. And so from a few inches away to a few feet away, it'll look like a smooth transition, like the colors are going from straight from that mid-tone up to my brightest highlight. Um, there are also some other techniques, like you saw me doing bri excuse me, dry brushing in incrementally lighter colors. That's the same principle there. You can use wet blending while the colors are still wet on your model, say I use both the light and the dark on there and I make sure that both of the colors are present on the model, then I would ah, just hold this here for a second while I have the paint. Uh, wet blending will take the two wet colors and then mix them together on the model. It's hard to describe. Maybe someday I'll actually do some wet blending and you can see it in person. Well, we're almost out of time here, so I'm going to finish up this layer of highlighting. And next time I'll be able to start in and get the Uh, get the rest of the arms done and hopefully move on to some more of the model here. So just take some time here and I'll finish up doing this part of the highlights. I'll manually add some to some of the scales here, being very light, because this area is impossible to dry brush well. Yeah, this is a difficult little section of neck here. I've naturally used up most of the paint on this brush. So I'm essentially using it like a dry brush, being very selective and careful. And I think that'll do for now. So we've taken this model and it's gone from completely gray. We've gotten all of the base coats on it today. And then we've started to work on getting highlights done for the gray scales. We've seen how to do some dry brushing. Let me bring it over here. Whoop. We've seen how to do some dry brushing. We've seen a little bit of highlighting on the arms. Uh, we've seen how to use non oil to its fullest capacity, making sure that it goes only where you want it and not where it wants to go. 
So we've talked a little bit about how to do your highlighting towards the top, focusing on the section that you wish to focus. In this case, it's going to be the cluster of heads. So yeah, uh, that's where we're going to call it quits for tonight. Uh, in future streams, hopefully, we'll be able to continue working on this anathema together. But thank you all, chat, so much for hanging out with me today. Uh, it was very nice being able to talk to you guys. Uh, if, Like I said, if you want to check out some of my finished models, if you're not happy with our work in progress here, go ahead and check out uh, Maggio Minis. My tag is up there on Instagram. You can go and look at some of the whole profile. Uh, but thank you all for watching. Next week, Jolly should hopefully be back on stream with us, and we're going to be playing some Relic Blade, to my understanding. So I know I'm going to try and finish up a couple more models, get some more going for my Lone Guard. We'll see what Jolly decides to bring to us. But yeah, thank you so much for hanging out with us. Uh, my name is Tony, and you've been watching Table Ready. <laughs>